Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, on behalf of the local organizers and the CERN theory group, I would like to invite to welcome you all to this uh, Winter School 2020, as well as our speakers. We uh, have uh, the scientific program consists of uh, five lecture courses. So we have five courses, each four lectures, and we will have one extra lecture on the beyond the standard model. A uh, few uh, uh, organizations, and uh, yes, so please, uh, during the lectures, you are very welcome to ask questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you have this thing here. You just turn it on, you ask your question, and then you turn it off. I hope it will be easy and uh, easy to understand. Uh, yes. We will also have uh, discussions at the end of the day where you can ask more detailed questions and maybe more open questions. You can, uh, yes, uh, try to get as much as possible from the lecturers. We will have a few... Uh, social events so uh, later later to tonight uh, we we'll have cocktails right here outside some drinks please uh, tomorrow we will have uh, in the evening we're having a dinner school dinner and if you would like to attend and if you haven't done so yet please register on the website there is some special registration forms that you should find and uh, because we were told there are not as many people as expected, so please, if you can do it um, un until lunch today, do that. So if you're leaving the territory of CERN, keep, keep your badge, give your badge with. Uh, then on uh, Wednesday, we are having a ski trip. Again, if you would like to attend, uh, you should have uh, told that, and there will be some doodle, I think, uh, set up for this, uh, um, for, the wed for the Wednesday thing. And um, I think that's pretty much it. So uh, we are very, very happy. Our first lecturer is Liam McAllister, who will tell us about complexifications. Let me start out by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's uh, a great pleasure to be back here. The goal of these lectures uh, is to build up the foundations for uh, string phenomenology, and more specifically, string cosmology, by studying the class of solutions of string theory known as compactifications. Uh, <clears throat> by the end of the lecture series, we should be able to examine what's known about the Sitter vacua and some things about inflationary solutions of string theory, at least in certain classes of solutions. And my intention is for these lectures to pave the way for the subsequent lectures by Aaron Palti, which will delve into more advanced topics. With that in mind, um, although I know that a handful of you out there are experienced uh, in many of the details of what I'm about to describe, I am going to begin from the very beginning and try to spend the first two lectures especially discussing decisions that occur in this process. How did we come to study per exactly this class of solutions? Why these and not others? Uh, what is the intention of the whole subject? Uh, and then in the second two lectures, I'll accelerate a little bit and start to move toward more modern things and try to describe De Sitter constructions, or at least the pieces of De Sitter constructions in string theory. Now, with regard to background, um, you're, of course, familiar with uh, and comfortable with quantum field theory and GR. I expect um, that you've had some encounters with string theory, perhaps many encounters with string theory. Um, the string theory background that's relevant for these lectures is, for example, what would show up in the first, perhaps, 14 chapters of Polchinski, uh, as well as some awareness of supersymmetry in four dimensions. Uh, if I can fill in any gaps in your understanding in those areas, by all means, let me know. Uh, I've attempted to describe things in such a way that um, all the concepts coming from string theory are specified and defined, although, of course, they're not introduced from the ground up here. We're only going to encounter very elementary aspects of cosmology, FRW solutions, the Lambda CDM model. Okay, so the plan... is to first talk about vacuum solutions. 
These will be compactifications on Calabiao threefolds. The next topic is the cosmological moduli problem. And I'll explain in detail how it's related to the properties of the vacuum solutions considered in the first part. The third main topic uh, is flux compactifications. These are non-vacuum solutions. And we'll do this first in 10 dimensions, and then we'll derive a four-dimensional effective theory. And finally, to the extent possible, given the time constraints, I will talk about de Sitter vacua, focusing on the scenario due to Katru, Kalash, Linde, and Trevedi, the KKLT scenario. So one place where you can find a bunch of references for this material is a book I wrote with Bauman in 2014, which you can find on the archive. So you can find references therein. Okay, so the topic uh, is, is string phenomenology, and string phenomenology, a definition I'll try to defend, is the pursuit of experimental quantum gravity. By which I mean the pursuit of an understanding of what quantum gravity is in our observed universe. So this doesn't lead us to the very deepest questions that show up in string theory, like why we have space-time in the first place, why we have quantum mechanics and gravity in the first place, but it accepts those things and then asks a very slightly more practical question, which is how to connect experiments to ideas about quantum gravity. And here, by experiments, I have in mind both terrestrial ones, as carried out here, astrophysical, cosmological experiments. Um, and on the quantum gravity side, we should really understand our current understanding of quantum gravity as achieved through study of string theory. Now, there are two poles of attitude about this. Uh, one attitude is that because of decoupling, there's no relationship. There's just no connection between the physics of the Planck scale and low energy experiments. Uh, the other attitude, which you will hear much more about in the lectures by Palti, uh, is the possibility that quantum gravity does dictate correlations among low energy quantities. And to understand them, one has to work directly in the Planck scale theory. So if we're gonna bring quantum gravity and experiment together, we have to begin with the most basic facts. It won't do to try to model in string theory very subtle and complicated phenomena before we've captured the most basic ones. So the most basic facts that we need are that the observed universe is three plus one dimensional and non-supersymmetric. In addition to being three plus one dimensional and non-supersymmetric, it's large, flat, old, and it's dominated by dark energy. And it emerged from a period of inflation or something very similar to inflation. At very early times. And, and finally, it includes a sector with the standard model gauge group and chiral fermions. And that's just about enough. Uh, to go into any more detail, we would end up running into theory limitations 
uh, in particular, trying to reproduce, let's say, observed real numbers, like the value of the dark energy density or the Higgs mass um, in string theory at our present level of development of the theory is questionable at best. We would all love to be able to do it, but um, let's first convince ourselves that we can demonstrably, provably recover these gross aspects. We're going to have quite enough difficulty just trying to find a universe that's three plus one dimensional and non-supersymmetric and dominated by dark energy, i.e. a de Sitter vacuum. So we don't want to get carried away trying to find, for example, the right pattern of Yukawa couplings just yet. Um, as a remark, there's a gigantic literature on doing particle phenomenology in string theory. Um, and over all of that literature hangs a very basic question, which all practitioners are aware of, but I want to state to you now quite openly. That problem is the presence of moduli, of light scalar fields with gravitational strength couplings, which will be the main focus of the first two lectures. Uh, in the presence of such moduli, one faces a host of cosmological problems. And so many, many of the statements in the string phenomenology literature about the standard model and variants thereof are statements which are true, but the models in which they arise are not realistic cosmologically. So what we're going to do in these lectures is cosmology first. We're going to try and pin down the underlying cosmology, get the vacuum structure right, find a de Sitter vacuum, on top of which one can eventually try and build realistic particle physics models. Oh, I forgot to say, um, so of course we have the discussion for long conceptual philosophical questions, but any questions whatsoever um, about omissions or clarifications or criticisms, please jump in and interrupt me. Okay, so now we're going to go from um, string phenomenology towards string cosmology, and so how do we do that? Well, we have to start with what we know about string theory. So most of our knowledge of string theory, which I'll abbreviate ST throughout these lectures, is perturbative. Uh, it is in a total space-time dimension different from four, and it involves extended supersymmetry. i.e. n greater than or equal to 2 supersymmetry. But we absolutely must have d equals 4 and n equals 0. And that's the basic problem. We're trying to bridge the gap between what we actually understand and what we need. And the basic compromise that's made in the subject is one can study n equals zero theories by studying n equals one theories. And trying to be a little bit careful about the effects of supersymmetry breaking. At least a starting point for building some understanding will be n equals one theories. So most of the work in string cosmology, most of the work in string cosmology either involves or it works toward one kind of thing, solutions of critical superstring theories with n equals 1 or n equals 0 supersymmetry in maximally symmetric four-dimensional space times. And of course, the maximally symmetric d equals 4 space times are Minkowski space 
ADS4 and DS4. Now, uh, one of my goals in this first lecture is to lay out some occasionally unexamined assumptions and try and talk about what's really the bedrock on which we can build a complete understanding, as a starting point at least. I, I claim this is our most secure starting point at present for understanding cosmology and string theory. So we're gonna, if, we're gonna go through all of these modifiers that are in here, but the claim is that most of the work in the subject essentially deals with or seeks or makes use of solutions of critical superstring theories that have n equals one or n equals zero supersymmetry in, in four dimensions in space times that are maximally symmetric. One would love to find space times that are more interestingly dynamical like inflationary space times, but the standard strategy is to begin with something simple like a de Sitter vacuum and then gradually study something a little bit more involved like a nearly de Sitter vacuum such as an inflationary solution. Okay, so what we're going to wrestle with is trying to figure out where we can arrive at such solutions. So how are we going to build solutions of this kind? So such solutions involve an internal conformal field theory with left root moving and right moving central charge equal to nine. The critical superstring theory, as you well know, is naturally formulated in 10 dimensions, and to get down to four dimensions, you need uh, six dimensions worth of central charge. In central charge, that's nine units, because you have the six bosonic directions, each with central charge one, and their fermionic partners, each with charge a half. So I'm making use of the fact that six plus three is nine. Now this could perfectly well be, for the general question of finding solutions of critical superstring theories with these properties, the internal CFT could well have nothing to do with the sigma model, with strings propagating on a geometric target space. So it could be, could perfectly well be some sort of general conformal field theory unrelated to a sigma model, i.e. unrelated to strings on a geometric space. But we know an enormous amount more about how to analyze systems that are geometric. It depends a little bit on which kind of questions we're talking about, but for most purposes and for most theorists, we're a great deal better at analyzing geometric solutions in which the central charge really does tell you about the dimensionality of a space on which the strings are propagating. Okay, and the reason for that is extremely simple. Uh, we've evolved to navigate in geometries and so it's a little bit easier to think about an extra six dimensions than it is to think about an arbitrary CFT. Such geometric solutions are by definition, well this is what the term means, these are string compactifications. And so the topic of these lectures will be string compactifications, geometric solutions with the above stated properties. Uh, now, I've included these modifiers, critical superstring theories, to remind you that there are non-supersymmetric string theories and there are non-critical solutions and non-critical string theories, if you like. Um, nevertheless, for the remainder of these lectures, when I say string theory, I'll always mean critical superstring theory. Okay. So stated once and henceforth, suppressed. Okay, this would be a good time if anyone has any questions about um, the direction we're going. 
or anything else? OK, so the first task is to try to find solutions with the above stated properties. And we'll do that as follows. The low energy effective theory of string theory is supergravity. And we're going to seek solutions of supergravity. Now, some of you are uh, real experts in supergravity, but for everyone else, um, happily, we're not going to need to worry about the fermions very much. We're interested in classical solutions. And in classical solutions, we can be preoccupied with just the configuration of the bosonic fields. So in fact, finding solutions of supergravity at this level is just going to correspond to finding solutions of GR plus some additional bosonic fields. So it's not much more difficult than GR. So let's seek solutions. A price we're going to pay by moving to the effective theory is when we find solutions, we'll always be wondering whether they come from solutions of the full string theory. So we'll have to examine that carefully. But we're going to make this move now. We're going to work in solutions of this theory, the effective theory. Um, and so we can. Start out with some sort of ansatz. Since I'm now henceforth talking about critical superstring theory, I'm going to work in 10 dimensions. So the indices m and n run from 0 up to 9. And I will take a product ansatz like this g mu nu dx mu dx nu plus gmn dym dyn where mu and nu range from 0 to 3, and m and n range from 4 to 9. g mu nu is the metric on some 40 space time, which I'm going to be assuming is maximally symmetric. So Minkowski space ADS4, DS4. And this metric, gmn, is a metric on a compact Riemannian manifold. Well, actually, it doesn't have to be a manifold. It can be a near manifold. It could be an orbifold or something. We can allow certain kinds of singularities that are permissible in string theory, but basically a manifold, and definitely Riemannian and compact. Now, at this point, I have not written a warp factor. We'll encounter one later. So I have not written in front of the Minkowski part, or ADS part, some function f of y. I've taken that to just be a constant. That'll come back later. Right now, so I'll cross this out. Right now, we have a pure product, a Cartesian product of the two spaces. Okay, so this is all in the spirit of starting with the simplest possible things and gradually developing them until we can build up the more complicated ones that interest us. Okay, now a piece of terminology. We're going to define a vacuum solution to be a solution of the vacuum Einstein equations. i.e., in which Tmn is equal to zero, a solution in which the stress energy tensor is vanishing. Okay, just like the normal notion of a vacuum solution in GR. Such a solution is pure geometry. Now, we have to contrast that. We'll carefully contrast that 
to a similar sounding phrase, which is not the same thing at all. So contrast. Vacua, which by definition are just solutions of string theory. If I say that I have a string vacuum, I mean I have a solution of string theory. Often it'll be implicit, and we'll come back to this, often it'll be implicit if I tell you I have a vacuum that it doesn't come in a family, that it's isolated. But different workers use different notions, different specific senses for this word. However, it's important to note that vacua and vacuum solutions are not the same thing. There's a simple Venn diagram in which one has vacuum solutions here. The big thing is the set of all vacua, and so the complement in here are the non-vacuum solutions. Well, non-vacuum solutions clearly are just things in which there's non-vanishing stress energy. Um, and, for example, the flex compactifications that will be the main subject of the last two lectures are non-vacuum solutions. Why, if we're interested in non-vacuum solutions, are we starting with vacuum ones? Well, because we want a clean, simple starting point. It'll turn out it's a starting point with extended supersymmetry and a lot more um, mathematical tools available, we'll understand that fully, and then we'll start to introduce stuff on the right-hand side of the Einstein equations. OK. So we're trying to find a solution of the vacuum Einstein equations. And it's easy to write out the vacuum Einstein equations for this ansatz. They read RMN equals 0, which implies, since we have a product ansatz, that R mu nu equals 0 and RMN is equal to 0, where these are the Ricci tensors constructed from G mu nu, GMN, respectively. Well, R mu nu equals 0 implies that um, de Sitter and anti de Sitter are impossible and are only possibilities in Minkowski space. So all we've got as a possibility is Minkowski space. And Rmn is equal to zero implies that our six manifold. is Ricci flat. So that was pretty easy. What we saw was that if we try and find a vacuum solution of the supergravity theory arising in uh, critical superstring theory with an ansatz like this, then the only possibility is Minkowski space times a Ricci flat six manifold. Our six manifold, we'll talk about it a lot, so I'll just call it x6. So x6 has to be Ricci flat. So now we need to understand Ricci flat six dimensional Riemannian manifolds. We've been driven to that by our search for vacuum solutions. The trouble is, um, Rmn equals zero is a very hard partial differential equation. One measure of how hard it is is that in the six-dimensional case, again, this manifold compact, um, there aren't any analytic solutions to date. There are approximations. There are situations in which it's known that a solution exists, 
but no one has yet been able to find any solution. Now, if you ask your grandparents, why do people study Calabia manifolds, um, the, the answer you'll probably get is something like, or the best answer you're likely to get would be something like, well, you know, if a six manifold is a Calabia threefold, then by Yao's proof of the Calabi conjecture, that guarantees vanishing Ricci tensor. And also you wanted Calabia threefolds anyway to have uh, supersymmetry in order to solve the hierarchy problem. So, so typically told, The logic we have in inherited is something like, well, a Calabia threefold, about which much more in a moment. If you have a Calabia threefold, then the Ricci tensor is equal to zero. And if you have a Calabia threefold, then you have some supersymmetry. And anyway, we want supersymmetry to solve the hierarchy problem. Well, wait a minute. Um, first of all, those arrows only go to the right. And secondly, are we so sure we need low energy supersymmetry? I'm perfectly happy and will consistently throughout these lectures uh, assume that supersymmetry is valid near the Planck scale or the string scale. But we don't have any evidence really uh, for supersymmetry at much, much lower energies. And so I think this is not a credible justification for thinking about Calabia threefold specifically. What is a Calabia threefold? Well, um, uh, I'll be giving you a rather complete uh, story of that in just a few moments. So we're going to try and be careful about both of these implications. So what we'd like to arrive at then, in the spirit of exposing our assumptions, we'd like to arrive at a complete understanding of what choices actually led people down the road and should still lead us down the road of studying compactifications on Calabia manifolds. To do that, we're going to step back and be a little bit more general and do something that's um, purely mathematics for a few moments. So now, let's step away from six dimensions and suppose that Xn is a Riemannian manifold. Um, with dimension n over the reals and has some metric g. So here's xn and let's fix a point p in xn. So here's the point p and we're going to consider some loop gamma that travels from P around the manifold and comes back. And let's consider parallel transport of a tangent vector along that loop. So if I start with a tangent vector V at P and I parallel transport it around the loop and bring it back, what happens? So we're going to consider parallel transport of a tangent vector around some loop gamma. Now the set of transformations resulting from such parallel transport for all such loops is the holonomy group called P a gamma. P is the point and gamma is whatever connection I've used on the tangent bundle. Now, in fact, 
the choice of the base point doesn't matter if the manifold is connected, because if I had some other point, P prime, and I wanted to consider the holonomy that arose from loops at P prime, well, I could always connect P and P prime by go, traversing the loop this way, get over to P prime, and then go back again. So the holonomy group at P and the holonomy group at P prime by this diagram are related by conjugation. All P of gamma, all P prime, are related by conjugation. in GLNR. So we can think of them as equivalent. So I can suppress the, the expression of dependence on the base point. No one cares about the base point because we're anyway going to be talking about connected spaces. But I'm also going to suppress the specification of the connection because I'm going to use the levy chimita connection. So if gamma is the levy Javita connection, we write so I'll call Nabla, we write holonomy Xn, which is the same thing as the holonomy as defined above, taken with the Levy Chivita connection. But we view this as somehow a basic property of the manifold itself, and we call it the holonomy of X. This thing is called the Riemannian holonomy group. And that's the only holonomy that we'll be talking about in the remainder. So now, suppose Xn is orientable. and simply connected. Then there's a theorem due to Berger, which states that Xn is either a product space or it is a symmetric space i.e., the coset of a Lie group G by a Lie subgroup H. Or one of the following holds. And so now I'll tell you the Berger classification of homonomy groups. Uh, questions so far before I launch into the classification? Now, I include these possibilities that Xn is a product or a symmetric space because they're required to make the theorem true. We're not going to be concerned with them. We'll be concerned with all the other cases that I'm about to write. Those cases are as follows. Remember, we're talking about an n-dimensional space. Case one. The holonomy of Xn is equal to SON. Case two, there's going to be seven cases. N is even, it's equal to two times N, and whole Xn is equal to UM contained in SO2M. Case three, N is equal to 2M. The holonomy of Xn is equal to SUM contained in UM contained in SO2M. Case four, N is a multiple of four. 
then the holonomy of Xn is SPM, which sits inside SO4M. Case 5. Again, a multiple of 4. N is equal to 4M. And the holonomy of Xn is SPM, SP1. In, in my conventions, SP1 is the thing that's the same as SU2. Is contained in SO4M, but is not contained in U2M. K6. N is equal to 7. And the holonomy of Xn is equal to G2, which sits inside SO7. And K7, N is equal to 8. And the holonomy of Xn is equal to spin 7, which is contained in SO8. And that completes the classification. Now, several comments about this classification. Um, you might get the idea that, well, anyway, he's only interested in dimensions up to 11 or maybe 12, so maybe he just stopped. And there are other interesting exotic cases with higher dimensions. No. The only cases possible are these. Okay, so the last interesting case that isn't part of a series, the only interesting cases that aren't part of series occur in dimensions 7 and 8. So, so let's spend some time unpacking the properties of these seven cases and see which ones we should be especially focused on. We can name these things a little bit. Let's see whether they're special, some are called special, some are called exceptional, some are called Kähler, and some are called Calabia. Of these spaces, some of them are guaranteed to be Ricci flat, which is exactly why I've brought this up now. And some require further comments. Okay. So special, well, everything except case one. No, this one's called generic. Yes, two is special, three, four, five, six, and seven. Only six and seven are called exceptional. They're called exceptional because they don't come in series. Just like the exceptional Lie groups. Oops, you can't read where my checks are. Kaler, which ones are Kaler? Case two, case three, case four. The easiest way of understanding what a Kaler manifold is, is it's a manifold whose holonomy is contained in and possibly equal to the unitary group in the appropriate dimension. So since here the holonomy is the unitary group and here it's contained in the unitary group, cases two, three, and four fulfill that definition of being Kähler. Now Calabi-Yau, by definition, well, one definition following Yau's proof is you could say the calabi manifold is holonomy is contained in SU in the appropriate dimension. And there's only two cases of that here. Those are cases three and four, SUM and SPM. 
Which ones of these are Ritchie flat? Well, the Calabi Yau ones are Ritchie flat. And actually, G2 and spin 7 also. Okay. The only comments, um, just a piece of terminology, only case 4 is called hyperkähler, and case 5 is called quaternionic kähler. And you could be forgiven for thinking that a manifold that's quaternionic Kähler is Kähler, um, but they're not. Because SPM, SP1 is not in uh, U2M. That's why I wrote this here. So these manifolds aren't Kähler. They're also not Ritchie flat. Now in these lectures, we're not going to spend much time on anything except case three. And the reason for that is if we now seek, so what were we looking for after all? We wanted. n is equal to 6, and Ritchie flat. So the Ritchie flat cases are here. This can, here the dimension can be any even number. Here, and it's Ritchie flat. Here it can be any multiple of 4, which 6 is not, and it's Ritchie flat. Here it can be dimension 7 only, so not 6. Here it can be 8 only. So the only case of interest to us is the Calabia threefold case. Of course, that's because we're studying critical superstring theory. If we were compactifying M theory or F theory, we would have different interests. Now, with regard to being Ritchie flat, um, I complained previously that. Um, in the case of the Calabiao threefold, it's one can establish with some work that cases with this holonomy admit Ritchie flat metrics. So when I say Ritchie flat here, I mean, given this holonomy, the existence of a Ritchie flat metric is guaranteed. However, let's carefully note that holonomy of x6 equal to SU3 implies RMN is equal to zero. And with regard to the reverse implication, well, it's just not known. To the best of my knowledge, it's not even widely believed that the reverse arrow holds. I don't think anyone has a conjecture named after that person that says, oh yeah, everything that's Ritchie flat is in fact special holonomy. Now, you're entitled to make that conjecture if you want, because there are no counterexamples in the literature. No one's found an example of a Ritchie flat manifold that doesn't have special holonomy. I'm always talking about compact cases. Okay. So every example, so all examples, all known, Ritchie flat xn do have special holonomy, which means that they fulfill cases two through seven, one of these cases, but not S O N. Okay. But there could be a whole universe of, let's say, compact six manifolds that are not complex that have holonomy S O six and are nevertheless Ritchie flat. Now, you maybe shouldn't be surprised that no one's found examples of those kind. Because I already told you that no one's found examples even under the lamppost where you know there exists a Ritchie flat metric. You get holonomy SU3, and you know there's going to be a Ritchie flat metric. Nevertheless, people can't find them analytically. So how are you just going to wander around through the space of general holonomy spaces and find one? Uh, it's not, maybe not super surprising. But I have no information personally on whether there are infinitely many of them, for example. It'd be worth knowing. Okay, 
Um, it's also true famously that holonomy of x6 equals SU3 leaves some unbroken supersymmetry. Uh, and the easy way of remembering that counting is that little SO6 is little SU4 and four is three plus one. So if you think of the representations of spinners, you can understand them as being fours of SO4, and you can understand the action of the holonomy group as transforming three of the components and leaving one component a singlet. This is the famous singlet that arises in Calabi-Yau compactifications. Well, it's sort of a perfect storm of reasons for pursuing Calabi-Yau threefolds then, right? One is, via this complete classification, there's no other special holonomy way of guaranteeing Ricci flatness. Taking Calabi-Yau holonomy, SU3 holonomy, does guarantee Ricci flatness. There are no other known ways. There exists no other way using holonomy. And you also get supersymmetry. And what's more, you also get to use algebraic geometry to analyze them. So that's just a huge host of advantages, and that in some ways justifies the uh, enormous focus on this class of solutions historically. Now, compactification on Calabi-Yau threefolds has been enormously fruitful, but there's a fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that Ricci flat metrics on Calabi-Yau threefolds come in continuous families. I.e., Rmn equals zero has a moduli space of solutions. This is a fundamental problem for cosmology, uh, the reasons for which I'll explain to you a little bit in the remaining moments, but then primarily in the, in the following lecture. Um, in brief, these moduli correspond to light scalars in four dimensions, and they present grave problems for both early and late cosmology. And so understanding the physics of compactification moduli is perhaps the, the uh, key theme in, in string compactifications. But before turning to the cosmological implications of moduli, let's briefly talk about the geometric origin of moduli. One of the moduli is very easy to see. So suppose you're given a topological manifold X6 that admits some metric G with, with holonomy equals SU3. So G is Ricci flat, metric with vanishing Ricci tensor. So question, can we find G prime also Ricci flat? Can we find another Ricci flat metric on the same space? Well, uh, yes, uh, rather trivially, if we take G prime to be lambda squared G with lambda a real number not equal to zero, then RMN of G is equal to zero 
implies that Rmn of g prime equals zero. Um, this is what's often called the breathing mode. It's called the breathing mode because it corresponds to an overall dilatation of the space. And um, you know, normally when one gives sort of a trivial, flippant answer to a question like this, that's an unimportant, purely mathematical thing. Actually, no, the breathing mode is going to be, in many ways, our most important modulus in the whole story. But we'll want to figure out what the other moduli are as well. So when I say the breathing mode is a modulus, all I mean is that if I have a Calabiao with a particular metric G, I can dilate that uh, and preserve the Ricci flatness condition. But then there's nothing stopping me from dilating, dilating it slightly more in one part of space-time than in another part. This is why there's a light field in the four-dimensional effective theory. So now let's set up the problem of figuring out the other moduli. And to do this, we're going to have to at least introduce some coordinates. So we'll introduce some complex coordinates z1, z2, z3, and z1 bar, z2 bar, z3 bar, which I'll call the zi and the z bar i bar. OK, and contrast that with um, the indices m and n, which still run from 1 to 6. So m and n, when you see them, are real indices that run over 6 values. i and j run over only 3. So now we're going to take x6, a Calabiao threefold, and we're going to take g i j bar to be a Hermitian and Ricci flat metric on x6. Hermitian means that g i j equals g i bar j bar is equal to zero. So the purely unbarred or the purely barred indices uh, on g correspond to vanishing components of g. Okay. Well, since we've assumed this thing is uh, a Calabia threefold, then r of r i j bar. of g is equal to 0. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to consider a metric g plus delta g with delta g infinitesimal such that we'd like two conditions. We want g plus delta g to still be Hermitian. So that means g plus delta g ij, or i bar j bar, are equal to 0. And secondly, we want to see if we can find another solution to the Ricci flatness conditions. We'd like r i j bar of g plus delta g to equal 0. So this is simple enough. We started with the Ricci flat metric, and we want to ask, can we find an infinitesimally adjacent Ricci flat metric? If we can, if we can do this for something that's infinitesimally adjacent, well, then we found a, the beginnings of a family of solutions. We found a deformation of the metric. Now, um, how shall we go about this? Well, we can write a general G as, as Delta G is equal to delta G ij bar dzi dz bar 
j bar plus complex conjugate plus delta g i j d z i d z j plus complex conjugate. So i j bar and i j. OK, and so in the last minute of this lecture, let's uh, write out what the condition 2 looks like. So in a suitable gauge, OK, if you care, I'll tell you what the gauge is. The gauge is given by nabla m delta G M N minus a half nabla N delta G upper M lower M equals zero. So in that gauge, um, two can be linearized. The Lishnerovitz equation. which reads, which I'll call L, nabla M, nabla lower M, delta G, PQ, plus 2, Riemann, PR, QS, delta G, RS, is equal to 0. And one finds that the ij bar and ij, i bar, j bar terms decouple. That means that if we try and solve the Lichnerovitz equation, which is a linearization of the condition that the metric is still Ricci flat, if we try and solve this linearized condition for Ricci flatness, we find there are two classes of solutions that don't mix with each other. In one class, the metric that we're studying has i j bar parts. And in the other class, it has i j and i bar j bar. OK, so that's all I have time for this time. Next time, um, after the break, in fact, um, we'll continue developing this, and then we'll talk about how the resulting moduli are cosmologically problematic. Any questions? Use a, use a mic. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Does this gauge choice constitute a complete gauge fixing, or is there still some work to be done? Uh, That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I would have to stare at that for a second to see whether it's complete. Okay. I think it's complete, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? OK, if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Liam. And we will have coffee break and uh, start again at 11.